Hello, and welcome once again to British Cartographic Society TCM Talk. My name is Chris Tribunus. I am the chair of the, I'm the coordinator for the Tea Time Talks and will be today's chair. Uh, today's speaker is Andrew Farrant from the British Geological Survey. He will be speaking on applied geogra geograph geological mapping in, this, in South East England. So without further ado, I will pass you over to Andrew for who will give us what should be an interesting talk. So, I uh, hope you all see that, uh, see my screen okay. Um, yeah, a bit of background. Um, my name is uh, Dr. Andrew Barron from the British Geological Survey. Um, I'm employed as a um, geologist at BGS. I've been here about 25 years now. Uh, and my role is principally um, as a field geologist, mapping um, not just in South East England, but also um, various other places. And I've worked both in the UK, but also overseas, um, keeping in the Emirates. Um, so, yeah, most of my job is, is to come up but um, I also have a background in caves and casts as well, so cast geomorphology and um, hydrology. So, anyway, so tonight I'm going to talk about um, some of the geological mapping work that we've been doing over the last few years um, in South East England, because to give my role as regional geologist for South East England. Um, and uh, and um, so hopefully you'll get a better idea of how we make our geological maps. So um, as an overview, I'll start off with a brief um, outline of um, geological mapping and uh, our role as a geological survey in that process and how we make geological maps. And then the bulk of the talk will focus on the work we've been doing on the chalk in South East England um, and uh, give examples of how we've how we, um, been updating our, our knowledge of the chalk and how we produce the geological maps of the chalk. Um, and that, involves talk about the chalk strictly and why we do it and, and what tactics we are getting. I'll finish up with some examples of, of the work that we've been doing. So um, first things first, um, geological mapping. And, uh, so how do we go about doing it and why do we do it? Um, well, probably I guess most of you are probably vaguely familiar with, with some of the work that we do, but um, most of our geological mapping work um, and a lot of the other stuff we do involves initially primary data collection. Um, and this can be uh, for a variety of different methods, um, principally field observations, going out in the field and looking at, at pits and quarries and cliff sections, that kind of stuff. But also data from boreholes, um, seismic data, and geophysical logs, um, and as well as 2D geophysics. Um, but also kind of looking at fossils and, and geochemical data, that kind of stuff. So the initial thing is the raw geological data. And then, of course, you go back and then you interpret it. Um, and this is where the mapping comes in. So obviously, a map is basically an interpretation of a lot of raw data. And that data can come from a whole bunch of different sources, can come from um, field observations, remote sensing, um, and uh, other, other data sets, data from reports and that, and um, other, other, other data sets. Um, as well as doing the mapping, we also you know, do cross-sections, field cross-sections, 3D models increasingly. And then obviously the, the interpretive geological data includes um, the memoirs, reports, papers, publications, that kind of thing, and, and, and visualizations. And all these things then feed through into um, applied geological data. So that's that's the stuff that either we do um, at BGS or that maybe that our data is then passed to, to other, other third parties, other our clients and, and end users to do what they want to do. And that could be creating groundwater models, could be engineering assessments, site assessments, that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, and uh, <clears throat> geotechnical risk and CCS modeling. Um, and then finally, um, that goes on to the end user objectives. So buildings and infrastructure management, aquifer management, um, minerals and waste, uh, nuclear waste, that kind of stuff. So whatever the end user actually wants. <clears throat> and you can imagine this kind of as, as a, uh, a Jenga pile, if you like. So the raw geological data is the key thing at the base. And the if your raw data and then your interpreted data is not very good, 
or rate of poor quality, then obviously your, your applied geological uh, data that comes off out of it and your end user results also um, aren't very good. So, um, so this is where having good quality data at the start and good quality maps is, is very important. So why do we do geological mapping and why, why are we continue doing it? Um, some people would say that, oh, it's all been done before, why are we mapping? Um, well, obviously the rocks don't change, uh, but what we know about them does change. Um, and we also have new data sets and new information. So we can produce better quality, higher resolution mapping. So we have new data sets like, for example, LIDAR from the Environment Agency. Um, this is an example from uh, the Peak District. You can see lots of nice uh, landslides, but also cast switches, stream sinks and sinkholes. And you can see changes in topography very, very clearly. Um, so, as I mentioned, your derived products, be it hazard maps, be it uh, models, are only as good as the map, the map in the first place. So if you have a map that's based on, on very old data, you know, maybe stuff that was mapped back in, back in the, the early part of the century, last century, uh, that would produce a very good map. And increasingly, what we're finding is, is that the, the, um, the quality of um, geological data is actually beginning to limit um, things like groundwater models and, and applicate other applications. Um, so if you're doing, uh, you know, creating a groundwater model, for example, then it, it, sometimes it's, it's not the, the software or the hardware that, that's uh, limiting the quality of the, of the model, it may actually be the uh, input geological data. And we're also finding that, that end users often want 3D geological models, um, and that just generally will require good quality baseline data. So you need the 2D before you can work out the 3D. So how do we go about geological mapping? Um, the clues are basically in the landscape. Um, so when we go out in the field, um, you know, if you go to northern Scotland, a lot of the, the outcrops there, uh, you, know, you can see them and you can physically see the rock and you can hit it with a hammer and it's, it's all fairly straightforward. Um, but of course, in southeast England, then you're looking at a large agricultural environment, lots of fields um, and urban areas, and you can't often see the rocks. Um, you have to infer what they are from um, the features, the landscape, um, and from other clues in the landscape. So we use a variety of different um, proxies, if you like. So we use uh, features in the landscape, breaks of slope. So um, you can see this is a, an example from the Isle of Wight. You can see that there are uh, breaks of slope, which often are uh, indicative of changes in rock type. So maybe a soft rock changes to a hard type, hard rock will give you a, a break of slope. Uh, you can see here, for example, you've got a valley which is cut out in some softer rocks. But you also see a change in the uh, color of the soil. Um, this is where you're going from you know, the um, upper green sand onto the chalk in, on the other white. Um, we also um, Look at things like um, outcrops and sections, so you have old quarries, uh, pits, stream sections, that kind of thing. So in the foreground here, you've got an old chalk pit. Um, okay, it's largely um, uh, vegetation now, but there's still plenty of outcrop there. Um, you also look at uh, changes in vegetation. So off to the right there, um, we can see um, Lots of uh, gorse, uh, which gets acidic soil um, that uh, is uh, indicative of a clay covering on top of the chalk. Um, but it also involves um, scratching around in old chalk pits and trying to find uh, the evidence. We also use other data sets, such as borehole data, uh, geophysics. Uh, remote sensing um, and existing publications and papers and that kind of stuff. <clears throat> the other thing we we uh, look at is um, fossils. So if you go out in the, in the field and you look at an old pit and you find some fossils, then often a type of fossil will give you a clue about what the uh, what the geology is. So you get certain types of fossils in certain bits of the um, 
rock sequence. So if we find, for example, Marsupites uh, testudinarius, then um, that tells us we're actually in the lower part of the New Haven chalk formation, um, and in fact, within the old bore beds or the splash point beds. So it can be very, very precise. Whereas if we find uh, Volcosomus, um, particularly in association with another fossil called Platosomus, then we can uh, we'll be in the bell tooth beds of the seed of chalk formation, for example. So fossils can be very, very useful and be very indicative of a certain part of the sequence. Um, having said that, some fossils occur all the way through the chalk. So um, you know, if you find, uh, for example, one of those fossils, then they won't tell you very much. Um, and this is an example from um, the Isle of Wight. Um, this is uh, just to give you an idea of the kind of data density. So this is the uh, central downs on the Isle of Wight. So up in the north, we've got Carisbrook Castle and, uh, and the town of Newport. Um, and then off to the west here, that goes off to, to Allen Bay. Um, and then um, so this is the, the central downs. And you can see all the data points here are either areas where you've got um, observed outcrops or material you've seen being brought up in ploughed fields. Uh, we've got the red triangles are areas where we've actually found fossils that are useful to tell us what the chalk unit is. Um, and we've also got lots of old pits and quarry sections. So <clears throat> all those different things, coupled with uh, changes in the landscape and breaks and slope, that kind of stuff, uh, can give us quite a good clue as to what the geology is. So um, coming back to South East England, um, as I mentioned, most of South East England is, is underlain by um, soft rocks, which have generally have little outcrop in terms of you know, cliff sections and, and, and mountains, that kind of stuff. So you're looking at mostly um, mudstones, sandstones, um, and the chalk. So you go from uh, upper Jurassic mudstones um, in this area here, coming through up into the upper green sand and the gulf clay, again forming lowlands generally. Um, the chalk, which forms the Chilterns, uh, the Hampshire Downs, and the North and South Downs, down into Dorset. And then you've got, again, you've got the softer um, mudstones and sandstones in, in, of the uh, pages. This is London clay um, and uh, some of the overlying sands that you get around Surrey. Um, you also get some Wealdon um, mudstones and sandstones within the within the Weald as well. And then coming further east, you've got the Neogene, um, which are mostly sand and clays of the Crag group, New Sangue. Um, and on top of this, you've also got lots of quaternary deposits, which again are mostly um, sands and gravels, the river terrace deposits, alluvium, glacial till um, to be in East Anglia um, and river terrace deposits. Um, so for the rest of the talk, I shall focus mostly on the chalk group because this is what we've been working on uh, most recently. Um, and um, as you see, it covers quite a large chunk of South East England. So it underlies you know, the whole of Chilton's North Downs, South Downs, Hampshire, under London, um, but also because it's up north, up into East, into Lincolnshire and uh, East Yorkshire, and all the way down to, down to Devon and, uh, and Dorset. So, um, so what is chalk? Um, I suspect most of you will be familiar with a uh, vague idea of what chalk is. It's a basically a very, very fine grained coccolithic limestone of upper Cretaceous age, um, typically about 200 to 500 meters thick, a um, little bit thicker in the, in, the, in the south, for example. And it's mostly comprised of these very, very small algae um, and fragments of algae called coccoliths. And also other microfossils and some larger fossils, mostly bivalves and ephyroids and things. Um, and the interesting thing about the chalk is that these, so these things basically live in, algae live in the, in the, in the uh, ocean um, when they float around and when they die, um, they sink and form uh, what we call a pelagic deposit. Um, although interestingly, the actual coccolis are actually too small to sink under their own weight. So they first have to be ingested by other organisms, usually plankton and other um, small, small uh, sea creatures, and excreted as fecal pellets, which then are big enough to sink. 
So essentially, um, most of South East England is actually one very large pile of um, plankton excrement. So that's where most of your drinking water comes from. Um, and it covers, as I mentioned, a large part of the South East England, but also across into um, across the uh, English Channel into northern France, the Paris Basin, much of the North Sea, across into northern Germany, um, Denmark, and uh, up into towards Norway. Um, and across, right across into sort of Poland and that kind of area. So a very extensive um, deposit. Uh, and also there's also outcrops in Northern Ireland and uh, Scotland as well. Um, and the interesting thing about the talk is that, that you know, it's not just a single homogeneous blanket. It can, we can actually divide it into several different units based on um, changes in lithology and uh, flint content things like that. And that varies both across the basin spatially but also through time, um, and particularly uh, marked at the basin margins. Um, so it's not just a single uniform um, deposit. So in the UK, um, the chalk was traditionally divided into three units, the lower, middle, and upper chalk. Um, that was fine. Um, and they just backed it on the basis of two hard beds, one for the Melbourne rock and one for the chalk rock. Um, um, the problem with that is, is that the uh, chalk rock um, is actually um, a fairly localised feature. It occurs in the Chilterns and uh, the Marlborough Downs, but you try and trace it through to the, to the South Downs and it, and it doesn't, doesn't occur. It's actually a condensed unit. Um, so, so the upper chalk, middle chalk and lower chalk doesn't really um, help much when understanding what, uh, for example, the engineering properties of a rock are. Um, so in the 90s, uh, work by um, a chap called Rory Mortimer down in Brighton, um, who was an engineering, looking at engineering schemes, uh, devised a new strictly based on engineering properties. And working with BGS, it soon became apparent that we can actually um, translate this into mappable units because you can actually trace the, these units through in the landscape. They form you know, the, the boundaries form uh, observable or mappable horizons. So we now divide the talk into these um, these uh, eight or nine different units, um, and then uh, and similarly in the northern part of uh, the UK, from the Wash northwards, we can again we a subtly different uh, um, sequence. Um, which we can, we can map out in the uh, Yorkshire and Lincolnshire. So each of these new uh, formations, uh, Quartzdown, Culver, all these ones, um, they each got subtly different hydrogeological and engineering properties. And that's because they, 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 there's slightly different variations in flint content, in the content of, of clay, and, and also their, their, their lithology, how, how hard they are. But within those uh, formations, you also get uh, intraformational marker beds or other important hydrogeological horizons. Um, these include things like hard grounds, um, these are beds of slightly more cemented um, chalk or chalk rock, uh, which seems to get you know, breaks in deposition. Uh, you get thin clay units called marl seams, and these may only be a, a few centimeters thick. Um, some of them are actually derived from volcanic ash fall deposits um, into the ocean. And we get uh, flints, um, some of which can form um, sentimental thick lateral continuous uh, flints that we can trace across the basin. And many of these marker beds um, you can trace right across southern England um, and some across into northern France and, and, and across into the North Sea. So uh, you can see here that you've got uh, lots of mile seams and hard grounds and, and flint bands. Um, the Seven Sisters Flint Down, for example, you can, it's named after the Seven Sisters up down near Beachy Head on the south coast. But you can trace that flint northwards through the Chilterns up into East Yorkshire. You can trace it across to Dieppe, where you can see it in the cliffs there. And in fact, you can actually trace it right the way across to um, the other side of Paris. So it's, you know, these things are, are naturally extensive. And you can, you can tell where you are in the sequence, um, partly by the, the associated fossils. And similarly, some of the mile scenes, again, you can trace uh, right across the basin. So this is a, an image from um, Rory um, of one of the Seven Sisters. So this is at Cutmere Haven. And the Seven Sisters forms a bed at the very base of the 
cliff and then you trace up through this place to the, the, the foreshore um, to the right. But you can pick out some of these other flip bands um, all the way through. You can see that there's some really nice joint faces here as well. So, um, and this is these, these are quite important when you're trying to look at engineering properties. If you've got borehole, we can pick out uh, some of these marker beds, you can identify them in, in core, and then you can actually then start to, to come up with a better site investigation model for your engineering scheme. Um, now, as I mentioned, there are, you, there are broad thickness and fascist changes across the basin, so, that, so it's not just a uniform blanket, as I mentioned. Um, you get some um, odd areas where you're getting um, slump structures, for example. This, you see the picture there of Flamborough Head, where you see some wavy chalk at the top, and sort of thickness changes in, in, in slump structures, uh, probably due to nearby faulting. Um, and in some areas, you get phosphatic chalks, so they're kind of Channels that are cut down on the seabed and filled with much softer, uh, very phosphate rich chalks, representing a sort of time gap, if you like. And these have in important engineering connotations because um, they're much weaker. And in fact, this is one of the reasons why the Stonehenge tunnel, um, the Bose tunnel at Stonehenge, um, is so expensive because it actually goes through um, a very, very thick unit you know, of phosphatic chalk, which is very, very weak. So when you go down the A3 3, um, you'll see some weird standing stones on the right-hand side as you're traveling to the southwest, but actually the, the really interesting stuff is the other side of the road um, uh, where you've got a uh, very thick and sedimentary um, channel. And that's, of course, impacted the tunneling costs. Um, another example, this is the view pit chalk formation, uh, which is part of the old middle chalk. Um, and you can see here that the yeah, data from borehole and mapping, um, you can see how the, the thickness varies varies quite a lot across the across southern England. So the Chilterns, it can be up to 55, almost 60 metres thick. But you come southwest, which down to Dorset, and we're only looking at maybe 20 metres thick. Um, so you can map out the spatial variation of, of, of these, these uh, formation uh, thicknesses, and, thicknesses and fashions. So, so why are we interested in chalk? Or rather, why are our end users interested in chalk? Well, um, one of the main reasons is for water. It's an important groundwater resource. Um, most people in South East England rely on the chalk for groundwater. Um, and increased population means that there's increased demand for water. Um, but equally, with climate change and, and drought, that causes pressure on, on, on streams and rivers. And of course, many of which are actually important habitats. So. Um, and uh, protected by, by various um, regulations. So, um, and there's also issues with um, contamination by nitrate, um, agricultural pesticides, but also urban runoff and other contaminants. So, um, so increasingly the water companies have to understand uh, the nature of the aquifer, how water passes through that aquifer, so they can't, they, they can no longer just stick a, drill a borehole down, pump out water with, with, with a gay abandon and without thinking about where it's coming from and, 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 uh, and how that impacts streams and stuff and, and um, uh, these white heron habitats. So one of the things we're doing at BGS is working with both the environment agencies who have to regulate the water companies, but also the water companies themselves to work out um, how, you know, <coughs> To better understand the chalk aquifer, both in terms of the geology, but also how water then flows through it. Um, and because it because the chalk is a soluble rock, it's uh, made of carbonate. Um, you can get dissolution in it, and the potential for some very very high um, transmissivity values for the so you get you know, a lot of water going through um, certain horizons. So you can see here, this is looking up the cliff at the base of a, a bedding plane. Um, you can see that water flowing along with what is actually sheet flint is actually dissolved out. That's conduits and cavities along that sheet flint. It'll be a very complex mesh of conduits. And similarly, the one on the right here is uh, uh, this is a seven sisters flint. This is actually at Dieppe. But again, you see some very large conduits um, um, developing into that sheet flint, into that flint. So that has important uh, connotations for groundwater flow. The other reason why chalk is so important is because of the engineering properties of chalk. Um, being in South East England, there's a lot of engineering uh, schemes. So you're thinking that you know, lower terms crossing, 
Thames Tideway, uh, M25, HS2, um, a lot of these big engineering schemes will go, go through the chalk. Um, and of course, because of the variation in the topology, it may, may not look at there's actually some quite you know, quite big variations in, in, in the topology of the chalk. Um, you need to know which one you're going through to work out you know, what, which equipment to use. Um, Similarly, the, the amount of flints, if you, if you hit a flint such as this one here, you see the hammer for scale. Um, with a total boring machine, you want to know about it because that has a big impact on, on, on how the, the wear and tear of your cutting heads. So you need to design your, your tunnel boring machine appropriately so you can deal with both the very soft chalk but also the very hard fits. Um, the the, the fodge also influences the fracture style. So if you're going through the secret chalk, you get some really nice vertical fractures. Um, but if you're going through some of the lower chalk units, particularly the new pit, the lowest chalk, you tend to get a lot of uh, conjugate factors at high angles. Um, and these promote wedge failures. Um, so there's a case whereby uh, when they were doing the HS1 tunnel through the North Downs, there's a, a wedge of chalk fell out the roof and um, caused uh, some of them some, some rather serious damage. So understanding how the rock uh, Fail is quite important, both in terms of tunneling, but also cutting stability and drift stability. Um, it also impacts on how the chalk weathers and whether you're getting destructive chalk and putty chalk, which can influence uh, engineering properties. Um, I briefly mentioned cast a second ago in terms of groundwater, but you also can get sinkholes, um, areas of a very irregular rockhead, uh, where you're getting, you might get a uh, a pipe full of, or a distribution pipe full of sediment. So you might have a borehole in one place which might create a meter of, of soil over the chalk, and the next minute, just a couple of meters away, you might have 10 meters of, of clay and soil within this distribution pipe over the chalk. So um, that can have a big impact on the engineering properties of the, of the site investigations. You also get natural sinkholes, but also um, a large number of um, or chalk lines, which then sometimes collapse. This is one in uh, near Gravesend. Um, so you've got about three or four meters of um, sands and clays overlying the chalk, and the, the mine was dug through those sands and clays to get some chalk underneath and um, extract it to, to then spread onto agricultural fields to help neutralize the soil um, for agricultural purposes. And a lot of these are not are no longer known about because they're, they're, they're capped and buried and forgotten about because most of them are medieval in age. They do sometimes collapse. So um, understanding where they are likely to occur is quite important. That was in somebody's back garden. The kids were playing on it you know, back to the day earlier. Um, the other advantage about having a detailed um, stratigraphy is it means you can and looking from these, these um, high resolution stratigraphic markers is that um, we can, the means we can identify geological structure much better. So we can identify faults, um, but also folding and, um, and that kind of thing. So here's a couple of examples uh, uh, from the cutting and for a bypass. Um, you can see that where the faults are, you can trace these, these features through. Um, and similarly, this is a, a, a fault in the uh, exposed cliff at Falcon on four stairs in Kent, uh, dropping down this, this uh, key marker bed in the other part of the super chalk. It's actually a conduit bit up there as well. And we can use these uh, high resolution uh, marker beds to uh, design engineering ground conditions for major infrastructure schemes. So this is an uh, example from uh, HS1, um, going through the Thames, uh, you put four holes down, you do detailed logging and you pick up the marker beds and then identify which unit of chalk you're in, but also where it may be offset by faulting. And then the designers can use that, engineers can use that to design their, their tunnels um, yeah, and what, what equipment they're going to need to, to, to engineer the tunnels, what, what tunnel boring machine equipment, that kind of stuff. Um, and so that approach is, has been used on the lower Thames crossing, but also many other engineering schemes. But also, you know, also offshore wind farms, that kind of stuff as well. Um, so in terms of mapping the chalk, um, whereabouts are we with, with the work that we're doing? So um, this is kind of state of the nation. Um, uh, we've done a lot of work in, in the southwest, um, particularly around Hampshire, Salisbury Plain, that kind of area. So 
most of them, the maps, the biggest geological maps around Salisbury, uh, then of course the South Downs have been completed. And we're currently working um, in the Chilterns with the Environment Agency um, and the water companies, and similarly um, done some work recently in the North Downs. Um, and we're looking to do some work in the Henley area um, next year, fingers crossed. Um, we've also been working with um, Yorkshire Water up in the Yorkshire Wolds, um, where some of the maps have not been updated since the 1800s. So um, there's still quite a lot of work to be done. Um, the other thing I might mention at this point is that, of course, the other issue for mapping is that, that you know, things change. Um, the rocks don't change, but what we know about them does. And the end user requirements change. So, you know, back, in, back when, when the geological survey was first, first started, the, the main focus was uh, raw materials, so minerals, coal, iron, all that kind of thing. Um, today, the end user requirements are much more diverse. We've got decarbonisation, bad waste, tried to thermal, groundwater, infrastructure, all these different things that, that people want information about the subsurface. So it might be engineering schemes, might be ground source heat pumps, HS2, you know, all sorts of different things. But also what the client actually wants to change. You know, 30 years ago, uh, an engineering company might have said, oh yeah, it's all up a chalk, we know all about it. But actually now, uh, <clears throat> with the advent of you know, advancing the boring machines, they actually want to know in advance where all the mild seams are, where the sheep bits are, where the, where the big bits are. So um, client expectations change. Um, but also data availability and methods change. You know, we've now got new data sets and methodologies that, we, that, that, that you know, the, the, the original geological survey surveyors 100 years ago would have only dreamt of. You know, so if, if you had a geological map that was produced back in you know, 1910, for example, the heart of the sheep, um, you know, it was done before air photographs were, were widely available. You know, just the map before the, the white bubbles took off. But now, of course, we've got, you know, we've got satellite data, we've got um, LIDAR, we've got uh, lots of other different data sets, you know, lots of new borehole data sets. Um, so, for example, whenever, you know, you get the major road scheme, you get the, get the boreholes associated with that. So, um, uh, and lots of different uh, geophysical techniques, for example. So that can help us hugely in making a geological map. And of course, geological understanding changes. You know, people now, you know, 20 years ago, people thought the chalk was just low middle of the chalk, but now we do a lot better, you know, a lot more detailed maps. Similarly, the, the, our understanding of the quaternary paleoclimate over the last sort of millions of years has changed massively. Um, so, you know, 50 years ago, people just thought, oh, there were you know, three or four growth stations at that. Um, but actually, there have been dozens of them. Um, and you can recognize that um, in the landscape in, in, in the geological deposits. Um, and because of that, you know, we can now, now produce better quality maps. So um, we've got better dating methods, better lab techniques, better understanding of, of fault mechanics, that kind of stuff. So these are all things you know help us to create new maps. And if you're looking at say, if you're looking, looking at a very old map, you know, one that was map, you know, perhaps mapped in the 1920s, then you know, it may not show a lot of, this, a lot of you know, um, some of the quaternary deposits we've got that we now, we, we now recognize. So I shall show you some, some examples now. Um, this is the uh, Winchester sheet. This is what the Winchester sheet looked like um, before I joined BGS. Um, so you've got Winchester over here on the right. We've got nearly all upper chalk bit of middle chalk and a tiny bit of lower chalk around Winchester and then and the brown is the, uh, the overlying pillaging um, remnant clay and land group. And uh, this is one of the first sheets I was involved with and we mapped out the new chalk strat and actually it makes a huge difference in seal different, different formations. Uh, you map out the cold chalk and you know when you see the chalk. Um, pick out lots of faults, there's a fault up here which haven't been recognised. But also a lot of construction we've got big uh, anticline coming through here, corresponding syncline, another anticline through here, and again another syncline through here. Um, so, you know, it makes a big difference. And particularly if you're interested in groundwater um, and understand what, what the George is doing is quite important. Uh, this is an example from the Yorkshire Wolds. Um, again, it was based, the original map was based on 1870s and 1880s mapping with, with a little bit of revision, but not much. 
And um, if you're a water company person, you'd be forgiven for thinking that it's pretty uniform chop with a lot less faulty than structure. Um, so Yorkshire Water are interested in this area because we've got issues with nitrates, uh, low flows, groundwater flooding, um, and they are struggling with their conceptual model of groundwater flow in that region. So we're involved with um, Environment Agency, Yorkshire Water, ourselves and Arup to, to update our knowledge of um, Yorkshire. And when you look at the data, it becomes immediately obvious that you can actually see um, some features in the landscape. This is, this is a, a DTM. And you pick up these linear features here, one there and one there. And these are actually um, the zones of uh, highly mineralized and very, very hard chalk associated with faults. So secondary mineralization um, associated with, with, with faulting. Um, and similarly, there's a couple of old quarry veins where you can see this and demonstrate it. So straight away, without even leaving the office, you can, you can begin to pick up lots of lots of faults in, in the landscape and then go out and do a matching um, ground truth bit. Um, and it turns out that actually, um, so this is the old map, and we have one fault mapped here, and then the kind of vague fault zone coming across through um, the world view. And so you've got basically, you've got um, the Welton and Burnham chalk undivided, and the Flamber chalk here. Um, but when you start to get faulting, you see there's actually there's loads more faults um, mapped out across this region. In fact, my colleagues are out, have been out for the last few months um, working out around Stepmere, and again, you can trace a lot more um, faults in this, this, this part of the area as well. So there's, a, there's even more faults um, in this area than, than I've, I've shown you. Now, it's a big impact on ground to run. Um, the other work we're doing has been with, again, with the environment agencies and water companies in the Chilterns. So we've been doing a series of, of 3D geological models in the Chilterns looking at some of the various groundwater catchments. And a prerequisite of doing modeling is to do, do decent geological mapping to identify um, the relative needs. So we've been working um, from about High Wycombe, uh, the Misbourne, up through the Chess, all the way up through towards was Luton, and then more recently on the Bean um, around Hartford. And we've just been finishing work on the Upper Cam catchment um, of the North East. So we've been working this area over the last few years, um, improving the geology of that region. Um, and it's particularly complex in, in this area here because you start coming across um, the limit of the angling glaciation. So this is where the ice came down about half a million years ago. And once you get north of that, it starts getting very complicated with a lot of uh, glacial till and uh, deeply buried valleys and, and uh, ambush deposits. We've also got the Paleo Thames terrace gravels as well. The River Thames used to flow across from um, the Reading area up through the Vale of St Albans and out across this angle. And then the, the uh, angle actually came down, blocked it off, and then it overspilled south and then now goes through London. So there's a whole bunch of river terrace gravels. Um, to put in a form of course of the Thames across East Anglia, which you can map out in a lot of detail. Um, this is an example from the River Chess and the Misborn, and the, so High Wycombe is, is here. So HS2 will go through uh, this kind of region kind of here, region here. They're putting a the tunnel in through here as we speak. So this is the old map. Um, you can see that uh, there's some various Edge issues, but actually, when you map it out, um, you can identify all the different formations, but also um, some significant faulting. So, um, that kind of wraps it up. So, um, just so I can summarize it. Um, so, basically, we think we are still mapping um, in collaboration with um, third parties. Um, the application of the new chalk strap over the last 15 years or so has revolutionized our understanding of chalk, but also yeah. led to a whole bunch of um, much better, much more improved and detailed geological maps, um, which then helps us to use geological models. And that's been used by both um, water companies, environment agencies, but also um, engineering consultants for designing things like the low um, crossing and, and the other side investigations. Um, and we're currently working with Chilterns uh, and Northern England. So, and, and we are doing other stuff as well, other, other geological units. Um, and 
the last point I'd like to make is that a lot of our maps and data, so all our published maps are freely available online at our Open Geoscience um, website. So you just type, type, type into a search engine, uh, BGS Winter so she, she come up with it, and uh, so they're all available on our maps, or, 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 or all available online. So that's maps, that's images, that's publications, and the old memoirs as well. So. Um, Lastly, it's not just me doing it. It's a big team in BGS over the years, um, but also not just BGS people, but also um, co uh, colleagues from Environment Agency, uh, various water companies, particularly Affinity, Southeast, Southern Water and Thames Water, um, but also um, some engineering consultancies as well. So um, thanks to that. And um, I would also say that Chalk Goes Across the Northern France, so if you ever get a chance, this is extra talent in Northern France. Um, Superb exposures and uh, some very nice wine as well. So I shall leave it there. Um, and if you've got any questions, um, then feel free to ask. Okay, so thank thank you very much uh, for for the talk. Uh, deeply in, deep deeply interesting. Uh, looking at the looking at all the job, looking at all the uh, geology of the of of the of the south. So, so now we'll move on to the Q and A session. Let's see. Do we have any questions at this point? Okay. So, yes. So, what is the what? First question. What is the minimum resolution of imagery or lidar that you use to get uh, good data results? Uh, um, we tend to use air, photo, air photographs. Um, lidar. Uh, Whatever's available, really. So, um, in some areas, of course, depends on George as well. So, in some areas where you've got, you can you can use the, the, the lidar data and you know, the stuff that's available from the environment agency, um, and we use whatever we get hold of. Really, in, so, in some areas, you, you know, the high resolution stuff will, will will be better than the, the you know the, the two meter stuff, but it, it kind of depends on on, on the job, really. Mm -hmm. but air photographs are also. Uh, very important as well, mm -hmm. and it partly depends what, what scale you're mapping to. If you're mapping at you know one to ten thousand scale, which is what we generally do in the UK, then you'll you know, obviously want better you know high, high resolution imagery. Whereas if you're doing a lot of overseas work, so for example, we did some work in the Emirates where we were mapping at uh, fifty thousand scale mm -hmm. and producing map to hundred thousand scale, then for that then actually the you know, satellite imagery. Um, this is going back to ten years now, so it's. We use the same, but we use the same imagery rather than uh, photographs. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I have to, I have to say, uh, just just looking at some of the comments we have, I can see that uh, uh, I think I think you've impressed upon people up there. It is quite a dramatic uh, <laughs> environment underneath when you, when you look at the chalk. It's not just a. I, I think back to my, I think back myself to when I was uh, back at school and we were being taught about uh, the about about the about the chalk and limestone on the south coast, and it was very, very subtle compared to what uh, what what you've just what you've just mentioned there. It's just yeah. So, so um, so when I, when I first joined BGS, I was told I was going to be working in Hampshire. And I thought, oh god, you know, chalk. Well, uh, I don't know anything about the chalk. It's all white, thin and stuff, it's pretty boring. And but other colleagues were going to be working with whales and you know, scientific stuff. But actually, as it turned out, the chalk is actually to one far more interesting than I ever realised. B, it's very much applied, so it's actually, you know, it's nice to have a, somebody who actually wants that information and, and makes use of it. And also because it had kind of been ignored for, you know, the best part of mm. you know, 100 years, then you're almost looking at a, a black sheet almost, you know, mm -hmm. you have one sheet of just all up a chalk, and you'd be actually able to, you know, map out all these different units. It's actually, it's actually quite satisfying. Yes, it was. It was quite a dramatic. It was quite a dramatic difference from uh, one <laughs> from from the earlier maps to what well, to the early maps uh, to what you showed, especially around the uh, Winchester area where it went from. Well, I mean, if, if I did the Salisbury sheet, we see them and going to rise the sun. Yeah, they're all, all quite a mm -hmm. Yes, I have to say uh, the the whole the whole aspect of it, how it has of, with just the fact. That, it's a very, it is a very three D system, a very three D uh, thing you have to map, and it's uh, as I can see, it, I can see it's very difficult with the fact that it changes drastically from one, how it can change drastically just between the different layers, and uh, 
trying to map that layering on top of each other. <laughs> yeah, it's just, I mean, for us, it's a question of just getting your eye on them. Really. So, so, yeah, with, with a big experience, you, 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 they're fairly easy to identify, although it's, you know, it's kind of experience. But at the other parts of the country, you know, you have, you have some, you know, you have more obvious changes in, in, mm -hmm. in, in block type, so. Yes, so, okay, so uh, another one, another question. So. What is the time scale for replacing the very old mapping? So it's been quite a while we can see with some of it. And yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, so it's a bit, bit of a tricky one. It's kind of, it's kind of a bit there, really. Um, in the old days, when we had we had we had a you know a a, um, a program of work to you know, to to to, re, to replace the, the maps. Um, that's more kind of ad, I wouldn't say ad hoc, but it's now much more focused on. Um, on user needs, so mm. um, and because we have, you know, there's, there's a large demand from, you know, from the water companies, from the EA, and from engineering consultants for for other maps of the chalk and then that that you know, we've been doing a lot of focusing on that, and, and also by the same token, some of the old chalk maps are also very very old because people thought chalk was rather well, just just chalk and then you know, kind of you know, thought, thought it wasn't important to update, but of course that's not changed. Mm. So it does depend on, on the depends on, on one of the nature of the but also the demand and the drivers for it. So, mm. um, so that's kind of what more of the chalk. Um, so yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, that, so, that's so it does, does it will, will vary. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's that's very and that's very interesting to see how it's uh, that it is ultimately need it's ultimately the need based opposed to uh, just generally upgrade updating the entire. <laughs> Yeah, the collection. Um, I mean, part, part of the problem is, is that, that you know, that systematic mapping is, is it's not really seen as being as being particularly scientific. Um, mm. And you know, being a being a science based organisation, it can it can you know, people can say, oh, why why are you still doing mapping? It's not very scientific. You know, it should be published in papers of nature. Well, actually, you know, the, my view is that actually is that the, what most of our most of our users. You know, mm -hmm. taxpayers actually want decent choice of maps. They're not interested in papers and metrics, you know, mm -hmm. the maps. So, um, yeah, there's always a bit of this tension. So, because BJS obviously does a lot of stuff other than just mapping. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so I have to say it's been a very I have to say it's been a very interesting talk, and uh, you've clarified you've clarified quite a few interesting quite a few interesting facts about how uh, the mapping of the oh well particular of chalk, but also the wider on the geological side, which is, it's an area of mapping which I've always found interesting because they are just that very, very elaborate maps. <laughs> but so this has been very good at uh, shedding at yeah. least. Uh, I, I might, might just add that, that um, the quality of the topographic base maps also is very important because if you're putting a line on the geological map, you will use a topographic base map to orientate yourself and, and for the, you know, use the contours to work out where you are. Mm -hmm. So one of the reasons why the old maps are, or George maps are not very, you know, no longer very good is because if you put them onto a modern day topo, they don't fit. So, mm -hmm. so you know, the old maps, you know, they might have had a, had a, a George mapping, and they might have known exactly what George was, but he might have had a map with only 100 foot contours on it. If you're just mm -hmm. trying to draw a line which you would get into a valley and back out again, mm -hmm. you know, you would have to base his line based on contours. Mm -hmm. If you've got a very poor quality topographic map, then yeah, it means that the, the, the geological line may not exactly fit the, 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 the topography. So when you now drop an old map onto a modern day DTM, it looks like the geology is going up and down the conference. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it should be going, maybe if it's flat, then it should be going random. Mm -hmm. So base maps have a um, form. Okay. So, yeah, that's an interest. And not, it's again, it's interesting. It's just a very interesting field. And that's, just how it interacts with everything else. So, so I think I think we'll just uh, bring this uh, to a close. So, I want to uh, thank everyone for joining us today. I want to thank Andrew once again for the genuinely interesting talk and uh, great insight into the into geological mapping. So, our next talk uh, will be from uh, Tim Hopkin, where he'll be talking to us about the land app. So we look forward to seeing you on the future. So for now, thank you and goodbye.